so nice to be here with y'all this morning. You know, all the way from Houston, Tyler. Travel was nice and safe. Thanks to the McCombs for caravanning me here. <laughs> Appreciate that. And a great Bible study this morning. Uh, I did a great job with that. And uh, it reminds me that, uh, you know, it talks about in the Bible about mobile devices and cell phones. We were in Exodus. We're talking about Moses going up on Mount Sinai. Apparently he was the first one to use tablets to download something from the cloud. <laughs> I promised I wasn't going to tell jokes, but I mean, okay. old habits die hard. So love, what is it? It's the topic of this sermon today. It's not the happy, clappy, churchy, you know, sermon on love. It's about what love is not. A lot of the tragedies that have been going on in the world lately, you get a lot of people and a lot of groups that are talking about Christians need to love more, right? These, uh, the gay pride folks, the LBGTQI, yay, elemento, Z, you know, running out of letters, aren't they? They say that we need, to, as Christians, we need to love more. What do they mean we need to love more? Like if we just love our brothers and our sisters that are maybe living not right according to the, the book here that everything's going to be alright it's going to be okay just love a little more you'll be alright right that's what they tell you just, you just need to have a heart you know all those illegal immigrants that come over here you just need to love them a little bit more and they'll be alright I don't know you know I think love is used to force us to accept lifestyles that aren't necessarily in alignment with what it's talked about in the Bible they use it as guilt they use it to beat it upside the head because we're a Christian. Oh, they'll say this one to us a lot of times. They'll say, well, you're supposed to love your neighbor, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that's true. That's true. That's right. We're supposed to. But are we supposed to follow our neighbor? Are we supposed to agree with our neighbor's lifestyle? I don't know. What does God say about love? Does He want us just to love everyone no matter how they're living? What does He say about sin? Today we'll examine what the Bible says about love, how God wants us to love Him, how God wants us to love our brothers and sisters, and even what the Bible says about how God wants us to love ourselves. Let's begin. As you very well know, hopefully, the Bible that you have in your hands today is an English translation. The words that are translated love in this English version come from four Greek words. Eros, Storge, agape, and philios. These are all the four types of love that will be rendered love here in your Bible. And I'm going to explain what each one of those words mean because it's important to be good students of the Bible to know what these words mean. When they rendered love, we start to think about there are all these different things. Well, let's look at this a little bit more. Eros refers to the kind of physical love a man and a woman share. It's a very important kind of love that helps to create families. It's important. That's a romantic love shared between the sexes. Philios means warm affection. It's like the friendship that you share. Think of a, a couple friends together, right? This is the kind of love that they share. Agape. This is the sacrificial love, the unconditional love that God has for man. Think of John 316. That's the word that's used there. Storge is the last one, and I really won't talk about that as it's only used one time in the New Testament, but it is love in the familial sense. What's interesting is that in the New Testament, agape is the highest form of love. But outside of the New Testament, the word love was rarely used. Prior to the New Testament times, agape did not carry any kind of significance or special kind of connotation of being a higher kind of love. Thus, it's the New Testament's understanding of the unique nature of God's love for man. Not the words, uses, the words usage and the Greek-speaking word world for the first century. So there really is kind of a new word that emerges, agape, out of that New Testament time. The Greeks weren't, in other words, the Greeks weren't really using this word as the Christians use agape. And again, agape is the word that was used in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And we are commanded to love God, Matthew 22.37, and love one another, John 
13.34 with agape love. These are all the scriptures that are used that use agape love. It's also the love chapter. The word that's used there that's sometimes rendered as charity is agape, charity or love in 1 Corinthians 13. I want to turn here to, you know, some great examples of knowing these different types of love. Let's turn to John 21, 15. Here we have an account with Jesus eating with the disciples on you know, breakfast on the, on the coast there. And this is this account with Peter and Jesus. And he's asking him if he loves him. You know, Peter, do you love me? And um, let's read it because it's important to know what the, wo the, what the Greek word that's used here. Because it shows a shift. Normally you have you know, this idea that you have it here that it's uh, love. Every word, you know, Peter, do you love me? And Christ, you know I love you. It's just love over and over and over, back and forth. It might be a little confusing, but it's important to see the actual Greek word that's used here because you see some movement. So let's go ahead and open up in uh, verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And the word that's used here, love, is agape. So Christ is asking Peter if he agapes him, right? This sacrificial love, this highest form of love. Do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love, and the word love here is philios, you. That's the friendship love, right? So he's telling Christ back, I philios you. I have affection for you, Christ. He said to him, he said to him again, a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I philios you. He said to him, The third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you philios me? Christ comes down to Peter's level. He sees that he's asking too much of Peter here, right? He's asking Peter to come up to have this sacrificial love that maybe he sensed that Peter wasn't able to muster. I think it's a, it's a beautiful movement there that Christ comes down to his level and says Peter was grieved. Now we see why Peter was grieved, right? If you didn't know these other words, why is Peter grieved? Well, he's grieved because he knows that Christ was asking him to rise above this friendship love, to have sacrificial love for him. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you Philios me. <laughs> and he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I filio you. So again, it's important to know when the Bible is using that word love, what it's actually talking about. What is it pointing to? And it helps to give you bigger, bigger context as to what the Bible really does say about love. So let's talk about love a little bit more, about how we are to love. To say that agape love is the highest form of love is not to say that any other forms of love are insignificant or to minimize them. Like I said earlier, there's a, a word called eros, which is the love that is expressed between husband and wives and is shared in marriage. It's a very important kind of love. It's meant to connect uh, a husband and a wife and to, to create families. There's also philios, which is a uh, the friendship love that's meant to create communities. We have philios here. We have good friends. That's an important part of, um, and I don't want to trivialize these points uh, of, of kind of love. What I want to affirm, though, is that agape is singularly unique. You don't want to confuse these kinds of love with the kind of love that agape is. Because all genuine love comes from God because what? God is love. A biblical definition of love must start with God, whether that be a romantic love between the husband and wife or this filius love, the genuine love that comes from God because God is love, 1 John 4.16. If God is love, then we love others best when we love Him most. I'll say that again. If God is love, 
then we love others best when we love him most. The followers of Christ are to be known by what? By the love they have for one another. Jesus commanded his followers, Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John 13, 34 through 35. The word Jesus used for love here is the verb form of agape. It's the action form. You know, sometimes people think that love is a feeling. Well, it kind of is, but what's important is that you do something about that feeling. Right? People have this thing where they say, well, it's the thought that counts. Right? You know? I tend to disagree a little bit, you know. I want to get a gift, you know. <laughs> well, it's the thought that counts. Well, yeah, but it's the action, right? It's the, the effort that that feeling, you know, you, you had the feeling of love, so you did something about it. That's, that's important. That's agape. That's the verb form of love. It's the doing. It's the sacrifice. It's also the word that Jesus used for love when he talked about, as I have loved you. In other words, we are known by our self-giving, sacrificial, unconditional love for one another. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 13, describes what such love looks like, practically speaking. It's the obligatory love chapter. And what kind of sermon would this be without us getting into 1 Corinthians 13? <laughs> The greatest gift. So let's do that now. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians 13. We'll pick it up at verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. You know, just speaking a bunch of noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy, I know what's going to happen. Right? And understanding all mysteries, I know everything that was, that's going to be, that will ever happen. And I have all knowledge. And though I have all faith, I know that it's going to happen. So that I could remove mountains. I have power. Not only do I have knowledge, but I have the ability to move mountains. I am, I am powerful. But, that, but I don't have love? I'm nothing. That's, that's something. That means if you have it all figured out, if you can do all things, is what it looks like here, if you don't have love that's characterizing those actions, it's for naught. It's not going to make it. It's not going to cut it. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, it's a good thing. We should definitely take care of the poor. And though I give my body to be burned, I have conviction for what I believe in. But, not, but have not love? Then what's that conviction for? It profits me nothing. It's not for anything. What is this all for? Love suffers long and is kind. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? <laughs> I know we can all think about moments that we have long suffered. We've waited in pain for that thing to shift, for that thing to move, for that person to stop. You're doing it right. I want to say you're doing it right. Hold on a little bit longer. Care a little bit more. Hug a little bit more. Love does not envy. You know, this one's interesting. Because it's, it's hard when you love someone, you see them growing, you see them becoming great. And there's almost this, well, what should I do when they're becoming so great? When they're becoming so wonderful, I, I have to do something. I have to become great. I have to rise to this. And you start to almost envy them. You can see how this love is now turned into a form of envy. And Paul knew this. He said, look, does not envy. Does not parade itself about. It's not puffed up, then get the big head. Right? Does not behave rudely. I don't know about that one. You know, <laughs> we need to share that with some people does not speak of its own, does not seek its own, I'm sorry, does not look around for its brothers and sisters only to share its love with those that they know. You know, see someone on the street that you don't know, give them a, give them a wink and a nod, a smile, a wave, change their whole day. It's not provoked, thinks no evil, 
We'll get into that later. Does not rejoice in iniquity. We'll also get into that later. But rejoices in the truth, right? Because we know all these things. We know that love is going to make it all work. It rejoices in truth because it wants to know that everything is revealed because we have a pure heart. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It's here for the long haul when you love someone with agape. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. This part that we know, right? But when that which is perfect has come, right? When that coming day that's out there in front of us comes, then that which is in part, well, that thing that we knew will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became as a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, and boy, ain't it the truth. Anyone coming to you saying they have the capital T truth, you remind them of this scripture right here. Some other translation said we look through a glass darkly. My dad would always tell me that. Son, we don't know. There's a lot. We're on a need-to-know basis. <laughs> and a lot of what God does for us is He hides some things, I think, for our own protection. And we've got to accept that. We can only do what we can with what we've got. Because we have that whole thing going on. We're looking through this telescope with all these clouds in the way, right? We're looking through it dimly. But eventually we are going to see through those clouds and we are going to see, but then face to face here, right? That's what it says. But then face to face with our Creator, we will then become aware of what is going on. Now I know in part, the small part that we do know, but then I shall know just as I am also known. Hmm. God will see us. He will know all of us. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. All right. I get it. Got it. <laughs> love. But how do we practice this love? Talked about it earlier. Do we just accept everyone because we want to love them? We accept everyone based on how they feel about themselves, how they identify. That's that big thing right now, what everyone's, what do I identify as? You just love them because of they identify as being, I'm not going to get into it, but you know what I'm talking about. You just, you're, you're enabling, I think. Should we just throw out the Ten Commandments? <laughs> because we don't, because we just want to love everyone and move forward, right? We've got to hold on to these things. I had a buddy who said, Love the sinner, hate the sin. Let's turn to that in our Bibles. Oh, oh wait, that's not a scripture in the Bible. So what does God really say about this? How does God separate love from the sin? Let's look at that. In support of the idea that we should love, maybe the sinner... Let's go to 1 John 4, verse 8. All right, there you go. Gotta be quick, it's that one page there. <laughs> so. 1 John 4, 8. There we go. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And there you go. Okay, so we should love. I get it. We should love. That's in support of that idea. Love the sinner. Now in contrasting that idea, let's turn to Psalms 5, verse 4.
for you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. Hmm. I don't know. Nor shall evil dwell with you. I don't know. Are we really helping those people out if we just enable them by letting them go along with what they're doing? Are we really loving them? It looks a little different. God hates evil. So we read that God loves us, but he hates evil. So be careful. God did not say, love the sinner and not the sin. He did not say that. So be careful when you head down that pathway. Let's look at what evil is. Let's turn to Galatians 5. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, uh, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, self-ambitions, uh, dissensions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I told you before, just as I told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you want these people you are to love to inherit the kingdom of God, don't we? You see the, the problem here? See where it's a kind of slippery slope by loving these people that are not doing what God has asked them to do? I mean, you should love them, but how does that look? How, how do you help them to move through those lifestyle changes is what we're looking at here. We can turn to 1 Corinthians 13.6 as well. Back a couple pages. does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. We don't, he doesn't celebrate sin. He doesn't turn a blind eye to it, blind eye to it, and even flees from it. Let's go to 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. 2 Timothy 2. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Flee those things. Get away from them. So God wants us to love and to flee sin or evil. What does God want us to do with evil? Let's turn to Proverbs 4. <laughs> Proverbs 4, 14. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. So what does he want us to do with evil? He wants us to pass on. If we see someone stealing, do we say, oh, well, just love them and accept it and accept them? No, we don't. <laughs> That's not loving them. And again, God wants us to love our fellow man. He hates evil, which is sin, and he said to avoid it at all cost. So how should we feel when we see sin or evil? We should be, you know, we should pull ourselves away from it. We should flee from it. 
And most importantly, don't, don't get caught up in the new love movement. That's the thing, this whole new love, the free love thing. Never has such a small word cause so many big problems. <laughs> I mean, really. Turn from Sodom and Gomorrah, period. So, how do we love properly? We'll talk about three points here. To love God first, to love mankind, and also to love yourself. So, love God first. Let's pray to God. That is a, a tool that is underutilized. Let's turn Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then shall I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So, pray, yes, but humbly pray to God. That's how we love God. We're to follow God. Let's turn to John 14, 15. I don't even think you need to turn there, do you? <laughs> if you love me, keep my commandments. We are also to sacrifice to God. I'm talking about it this morning, about sacrificing animals, sacrificing these creatures to God for our sins. This was an Old Testament thing. How do we love God? Will we sacrifice to Him a living sacrifice now? Let's turn to Romans 12. Pick it up in verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So don't be conformed to this world sacrifice be a living sacrifice to God all your actions should be imbued as a gift to, fa to the Father aligned with what he wants you're to honor God's name you can write this down for brevity's sake it's in Exodus 20 verse 7 so how are we to love our fellow man there's this idea about how we're supposed to properly love man we're to serve them right Let's turn to Galatians 5. Verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. There it is. Love our brethren by serving them. We even have in Matthew 20, verse 28. You can write that down for later an example that we're to serve our fellow brothers and sisters. We're also loving our, our fellow man and brothers and sisters by being an example, right? We're showing them a way to live, a way to love. Let's turn to Philippians 3:17. Brethren, join us in following my example, and note those who so walk, as you have for us a pattern. All right, we're supposed to be a pattern for them. We're supposed to be showing them a way that they can do this. I call it piggybacking, 
monkey see, monkey do, <laughs> right? <laughs> we need to really be lovingly guiding these folks towards a way of life that works. The dirty little secret is that what they're doing is not going to work. At some level, at some point, the house is going to come down around their ears, and they're going to be in pain. They're going to come back to you and say, well, why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you tell me? I wish there was something out there that was a book of, maybe a book of sayings that would help me to live a, a life that's right and good and true. Oh, wait, Jack, yeah, there is. It's called the Bible. We've been talking about this for a while. <laughs> You know, you get some of these people. I, I, I had a, a pretty good construction business for a while, and these guys that I hired would just get mixed up in alcohol and mix up in drugs and all kinds of stuff, and they would come to me. The big problem really was, was having kids out of wedlock. That was the one that they should have been warned about, how much that can mess your life up. I mean, kids are a gift from God, don't get me wrong. But if you have, you have them at the right time in the right place. If you have them out of wedlock, child support can paralyze what you're able to do later in life. It can literally limit your options to only going right to work and getting, you know, to get the money to help them out and take care of those kiddos. You can't pursue higher education, all these things about your life that, you know, you could do a lot better. Anyways, don't want to get off on a tangent. Stick to the notes. <laughs> but it's important to be an example for those men, those women that do have these things that are going on in their life. I think you love them the best when you be a pattern for them. And again, you can write down for brevity's sake, John 13, 15, as another example of how we can be an example. <laughs> love your enemy. Whew. That's a hard one. You know, what's interesting about this scripture is God chose to use the word agape in loving your enemy, which makes sense. He didn't use the word philios. He doesn't ask you to have a warm and fuzzy feeling about your enemy. He knew that to be silly. Well, I don't know if he, I don't know what he knew, but I, I believe and I feel that he felt like that would be too much, maybe, <laughs> to have a warm feeling and, and think about them as your best bud. But you can act, you can turn, you can do so in a good turn no matter what, no matter what they've done to you. As we were talking on the way over here, we said, you know, you can really be untouchable in a lot of ways to this world when you are centered in Christ and you're centered in God and what His plan is for you. There's almost, almost anything can happen to you and you can rise above it. It's amazing what you can put on and go through. But let's turn to Luke 6, 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, agape your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. You know, there's this family who goes to our church, and, um, you know, we, they're, they're, they're a work in progress, as we all are. And, you know, we notice that the days that the church will buy lunch afterwards, they seem to always make those days. You know, and, uh, and the days that we don't, they don't seem to really show up. And, you know, uh, so one of the brethren was very concerned about this. He said, you know, well, they just seem to be wanting to use us for, for a free meal. I thought, you don't think we understand that they're here to to use us, right? Just, you know, they're not spitefully using us, but they're using us, right, in, in some way. But it's, but it's important. They're there, right? Let them use you. Let them think they're getting one over on you because they are sitting in those seats. They're going to have an opportunity to hear the, God, the Word of God, at least. And so we, we, we said, you know, sit down, be quiet, you know. <laughs> Let them come. They will, you know, we, we were fine, you know, the bank account's all right, we're, we're okay, we're not going to be out on the street, you know, on the street corner meeting, uh, we'll be okay. <laughs> you know, the, the church till can, can handle it. We're also to forgive our brothers, right? To love them, we are to, how we love them was we are to forgive them. I mean, we know probably where we need to go. Matthew six fourteen. That'll 
lot of y'all can just tell me what it says before even turning there. Matthew six fourteen, For if you forgive men their, trans their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. It's kind of an interesting good deal here, right? It's a win-win. Uh, you know, not only if you forgive them are you loving them truly, but you're also getting some forgiveness from your Father. But it's one of the hardest things to do to forgive someone when they've harmed you and they've wronged you. It's one of those challenging things we have to work on. At least I have to work on. And we do have Mark 11, 25. You can write it down for, again, another proof that we are to forgive. Don't follow your enemy, though. So we love them by also not doing as they do. It's kind of weird, but... Turn to Psalm 118. <coughs> Psalm 118, 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord and to put confidence in princes. Like we said, if you can get trued up to God, you can go through anything. Don't put your confidence in men who are fallible. Trust but verify, is what my dad used to say. Nothing wrong with that. And lastly, let's look at how we are to love ourselves. You know, you're a beautiful creation. All of us. My dad say, you're perfectly imperfect. I always thought that was a weird thing to say. Perfectly imperfect? Is that a real thing? I think even Ron Dart did a great sermon about being perfectly imperfect as well. And the idea is that we are perfectly unique. So in a lot of ways, they use some of these things about being unique and that there's something perfect about that, something beautiful about being unique, and they turn it on its head and make it something perverse. But God does make us Unique. He gives all of us different gifts, different talents. And if we knew everything that everyone else knew, then we would have nothing to learn, right? So, take pride in that. Let's turn to Galatians 5. There we go. Verse 13. read it earlier. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are a beautiful creation and we should love everyone as we're, you know, as we are, as we love ourselves here. We are a work in progress. Philippians 1.6. Let's look at that. Hmm. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Look, it's, it's, it's happening right now. Don't get discouraged. Love yourself. Give yourself, you know, be easy on yourself. You know, we are, no one is without sin. No, not one. We all have our thing to work through. So the one thing I could say as far as loving yourself is be, be easy on yourself, and, but don't let yourself off the hook. You know, give, give, give yourself a little bit of a, of a beating, but you know, happy balance, balancing act there. So God wants us to love mankind, but he also wants us to run from sin and avoid evil. There's a balancing act there. It's not one way or the other. We need to figure it out for ourselves. I believe we should be an example to those that we can help by being that example. However, that doesn't mean to just, you know, save the world. However, that does not mean that we're meant to be here to save the world. Just as a warning message, we're to be an example and then we're to move on. I know it sounds harsh. It's not your job to save the world and to save people. The best you can do is love them by being an example. 
God has set into motion a way for everyone to find salvation. It's one thing that's singularly unique about the Church of God tradition that I love and cherish is the fair chance doctrine. There will be a time for everyone. I strongly believe that. John 3.16 proves this. He has created a way for everyone to have salvation. So, again, be an example. Love those that you love and care about by being that example. And again, turn people back to the Bible to understand what sin is and what true love is. Practice proper love and flee sin and everything will work out. Thank you.